Welcome to Newman Night. Earlier in the year, we sat down for planning and we said, who are some of the best speakers we've had that we want to bring back? And uh, we were trying to get Pete at the beginning of the year. But you know what, Pete? We got perfect timing. You know, this is the perfect timing. That the, the Holy Spirit led him to come now so he could talk about the Holy Spirit, which is the third person of the Trinity often misunderstood. Uh, so perhaps we can get some insights tonight. Pete hails from Michigan. He's married. He's got five children. And I don't, I don't want to say too much more about his story because he's going to include some of that with us tonight. But now he's the vice president for Renewal Ministries. It's all about sharing the good news in effective ways throughout the church. So please help me welcome Pete Burrow. Thanks, Bob. All right, good evening. It's good to be with all of you again. Uh, when Father reached out with the invitation to come back, it was an easy yes. Uh, I have a, a great deal of respect and affection for your priest. I hope you realize uh, how blessed you are to have him. Um, I've spent a lot of time in lots of different Newman centers and lots of different campuses and lots of different uh, universities, and it's pretty unique to find a priest who's as innovative, as filled with the Spirit, lover of Jesus, virtuous, and just like normal, you know? He's a pretty normal dude. The, the TikTok and the slow motion and the, all the things, it's just like, this guy, maybe he's not normal, actually, that's pretty abnormal, but it's good. So, all right, well, we would be remiss not to start with prayer as we're talking about the Holy Spirit tonight, so let's ask him to join us in a profound way, in a special way. St. Bonaventure said that the Holy Spirit comes wherever he is loved, wherever he's welcomed, and wherever he's expected. So pray with me now. In the name of the Father, Son, Holy Spirit, amen. Holy Spirit, we love you. Holy Spirit, we welcome you. And Holy Spirit, we expect you. Amen. As Father mentioned, uh, I'm, I have one wife and five kids. Uh, we like them a lot. And uh, we've got three girls and two boys. Just, uh, it's, it's a joy. And so there's, it's always a kind of a, uh, it's always a little bittersweet leaving them, you know, like there's, of course, the, the, the bitter part of having to FaceTime them. And, you know, one of them is inevitably crying because of how much they miss me, clearly. And, uh, but it is nice to sleep in a bed without little feet kicking. And, you know, there's, you know, four hour ch chunk of time without any interruption is pretty great for my life. So, uh, no, it's, it's so good to be with you. But before I was married, before I met my wife, believe it or not, I was part of the University of Michigan men's basketball team, which I know is hard to believe as a six foot white guy. Um, <clears throat> Uh, but please wait for the facts, okay? So my freshman year, I tried out for the team, and I didn't make it, which was okay. They asked me to be a manager, which was pretty cool. I got to uh, be around the team every day. I traveled with the team. We went to Duke and UCLA and Alaska and all, all the Big Ten schools. And then my sophomore year, I tried out for the team again, and then by so this time, by some miracle, they asked me to be on the official NCAA roster, which meant I was on the team, I was practicing every day, but the Big Ten has rules about how many people can dress for the game, so I didn't have a uniform yet. And then uh, a couple really good things happened for me. Uh, a couple guys got hurt. <laughs> a couple guys transferred away from the team, and next thing you know, I'm in Coach Beeline's office, and he is uh, somewhat begrudgingly saying, Pete, I need you to dress for the game tomorrow. And on the outside, I play totally cool. You know, yeah, Coach, whatever you need. On the inside, I'm freaking out. You see, this is everything I've ever wanted. I grew up in Ann Arbor. My dad had been a baseball player at Michigan. He was the MVP of senior year. My grandfather had been a gymnast at Michigan. My great-grandfather had played football for Michigan. Fun fact, he was the center for the Green Bay Packers in the first ever Chicago Bears Green Bay Packers game. Isn't that cool? Any guess on how much he weighed? 154 pounds. Yeah, yeah, times have changed. They're literally double his size now, right? So anyway, the point is, maize and blue runs through my veins. This is everything I've ever wanted. And uh, he says, Coach Bailey says, go see Bob, the equipment manager, and he'll get you set up for the game tomorrow. So I skip down the hallway to Bob, and I say, Bob, did you hear the good news? Dress him for the game tomorrow. And Bob's this old curmudgeon guy. He's been around forever, and he said, no, no, no. He said, I didn't have a chance to order you a uniform, so you're going to have to take whatever I have for you. I was like, Bob, listen, as long as it says Michigan on the front, we're good. So Bob rummages around in the closet. Bob pulls out double XL number 53 with no name on the back. <laughs> Not ideal. You know, no little boy dreams of being number 53. And, you know, double XL came to about here. So I, I took that bad boy in. And this is back when big shorts were still cool. So I was wearing a tent and pretty happy about it. Okay. First game was at Northwestern. Went off without a hitch. I didn't get in the game, which is great. I shot the lights out in warm-ups. And I did my job. What's my job? Well, every basketball team, it's required, has a little white guy at the end of the bench who goes crazy when somebody else hits the three, right? 
They've got all the dances and the handshakes and the things. That was me. I was really good at it, and I loved it, okay? Second game was at Illinois, and I promise this is getting somewhere, so just bear with me, okay? Second game was at Illinois, and uh, Illinois plays in an arena called Assembly Hall, and Assembly Hall is known for lots of things, but one of the things is their student section stands the entire game right behind the visiting bench, which is just great, you know? Because you learn all sorts of new words, and it's like a, it's a real confidence boost. They really help you to feel welcome. Radical hospitality, I like to call it. And so this particular game, we were the away team, obviously, and we were wearing our maize uniforms. Maize is yellow. We call it maize because we're Michigan and we're elitist, but it's yellow. So picture this, maize uniform, double XL, number 53, no name on the back with a white warm-up shirt, which is the key detail. Game begins, I'm doing my job, sitting at the end of the bench, loving my life, cheering on my guys, maize uniform, double XL, number 53, no name on the back, white warm-up shirt. <laughs> Very happy to be there, okay? It's about halfway through the second half, and this particular year, Illinois was very good, and we were not. So they were up by, I don't know, 15 or 20 points, and the students are starting to get a little restless. It's kind of a boring game, and I'm sitting there, maze uniform, double XL, number 53, no name on the back, white warm-up shirt. <laughs> Leaning forward like this, and there's a dead ball situation, and if you've ever been at a, a basketball game, sometimes the arenas just kind of strangely go quiet, because there's nothing to do. They haven't pumped in the music yet, and so I'm just kind of sitting there minding my own business, and all of a sudden, this voice shouts out from behind me, number 53. Number 53, who are you? <laughs> you see, he had looked down on my, my back and there was no name on the back and turns out I wasn't in the program yet so he was kind enough to ask. Uh, I ignored him as I had been trained to do and kind of hoped the moment was over but then I hear 53, 53, whose uniform did you steal, you know? <laughs> 53, are, are you supposed to be here? And right now my, my teammates are starting to nudge me. I'm like, shut up, shut up, pay attention to the game. And I thought the moment was over, but then to my horror, and this is true, a very slow but steady sound begins to build behind me. 53, 53, 53. And you guys are college students. You'll chant anything, right? As long as it's to that rhythm and your friends start to do it, you're going to join in. So within about mm, 27 seconds, most of the lower bowl of the arena is chanting, 53, 53. And I'm in this new circle of hell I didn't know existed. I'm, I'm sweating, I'm like, oh my goodness. And I uh, didn't think it could get worse, uh, but it did. Because the chanting quickly shifted from 53, 53 to put him in, put him in. <laughs> so now I'm, I'm just like, oh my goodness. And all of a sudden this roar goes up and somehow the chanting gets louder and I glance down the bench and sure enough, wouldn't you know, Coach Beeline has risen out of his seat and he's begun to walk very intentionally towards me. And as he gets closer, they get louder, right? 53, put him in. And I'm avoiding eye contact at all costs. Because <laughs> nobody wants to get in the game. Literally for the very first time in my career. It would have been like, now on the game for Michigan, number 53. That guy, you know? <laughs> they wouldn't have known who I was. So he gets to about for me to the chair, he stretches out his hand as if he's gonna put me in the game. I'm in a sweat, the crowd's in a lather. He gets this little smile on his face. I look up at him with what must have been the most pathetic look on my face. He, and he looks at me and he goes and he sits down. Oh. <laughs> and I melted into a puddle of gratitude. I could have kissed him in that moment. And of course the crowd, boo, loudest cheer of the night. All right, so why, why do I tell that story? One, uh, it's a little bit funny. And everybody knows you should always start a talk with something funny. That's a pro tip. You can take that with you. Um, secondly, uh, there's always somebody who played basketball who's looking at me, sizing me up, thinking, hmm, I think I can take him. <laughs> and uh, you can't. <laughs> and third reason is this. The Lord uses stuff like this, this was kind of a dramatic moment, but the Lord uses stuff like this in my life all the time to teach me a deeper lesson. And it was a few years later, I had, I had moved on, I had transferred to Franciscan, I met my wife, she was the point guard on the women's basketball team, I was the point guard on the men's basketball team, loving basketball, it was great. And a few years after that, I found myself in Ann Arbor in our Adoration Chapel. And I was just uh, sitting in an Adoration Chapel, the best way to describe it, I was just wasting time with Jesus. Like I didn't have an agenda, I didn't have a novena, I didn't have a prayer list, I just was being with my friend because he's my friend and I wanted to spend time with him. And as I was spending time with the Lord in adoration, all of a sudden this memory came to my mind. And whenever something like that happens in prayer, I'm always like, okay, Jesus, what's this about? You know, why am I thinking about this? And as I was reflecting on this, I felt like Jesus asked me a question. And it wasn't an audible voice, right? It was just that still small voice of the spirit where a thought popped into my heart that I knew wasn't my own. And he said, Pete, why didn't you want to get in the game? Why didn't you want to get in the game? 
And I immediately thought of every reason why I really shouldn't have been the one in the game. I probably actually wasn't good enough. I wasn't really wearing the right thing. You know, I thought about like, well, what if I'd thrown the ball out of bounds or forgotten a play or something? What's really interesting though is growing up, I was uh, a fan of the team, right? I started as a fan and I'd worked incredibly hard to be on the team. And I loved being on the team. And I loved doing everything that the team did, right? I loved practice and training table and film study and the weight room, I loved it all. But ironically, when it came time to do the thing the team exists to do, which is win basketball games. I didn't want to do it. I didn't want to do it. I loved cheering for the guys who were in the game. I would have written a check for us to win the game. I was all in conceptually about us winning the game, but I didn't want to do it myself. And then what the Lord very patiently but very uh, firmly showed me was that was exactly how I was approaching my life with him. How I loved being on Jesus' team. I loved being Catholic. And I loved doing all the things that Catholics do, right? I knew when to stand, I knew when to sit, I went to Mass every Sunday, I prayed the rosary when my ADD didn't derail it. You know, I'd get four Hail Marys in and be like, nah, okay, Divine Mercy Chaplet, I can handle that one, right? <laughs> Catholic jokes. Okay, so the point is, um, I was doing all the things, and I wasn't just a fan of Jesus. If somebody had asked me, are you Catholic, I would have said yes. But what the Lord was showing me was there was something more. There was something deeper. There was another level of not just being on the bench with him, not just associating with him, not just even loving him, but actually joining him in his mission. To actually do the thing that the church exists to do. And what does the church exist to do? To seek and save the lost. To proclaim liberty to captives. To bring people from darkness to light. From death to life. The big fancy word for this is to evangelize. The deepest identity of the church is to evangelize, to make disciples. And what I found is, it's not that I never said the name of Jesus to anybody. It's usually just like I had to have had a good breakfast. The sun needed to be shining. You know, I had to feel really confident about myself. And I kind of needed somebody like the setting to be perfect. And then as soon as I started to say his name to somebody or talk about something faith related, if it got a little strange, if they asked a question of, that I didn't know the answer to, or, if, you know, our generation's favorite word, if it got a little awkward, right? It was like, ooh, ah, ah, ah. I knew I wasn't ready. Got to go read another book or, you know, got to go do another course or got to go do something else. And I start here, friends, because I'm going to go out on a limb and assume that everyone here is at least kind of in the arena with Jesus, okay? And if you're not, welcome. Like, we're so glad you're here. A father would love to talk to you, and we can, we can make that happen, right? But what I'm not going to assume is that if you've been in the stands, that you've gotten on the bench, and that if you've gotten on the bench, you've gotten in the game, or if you're in the game, you're deciding to stay in the game. And tonight we're going to be talking about the Holy Spirit. And the Holy Spirit is, this is kind of my affectionate title for him. He's like, he's, he's all about more. He's all about deeper. He's all about the next step. Because whether you like it or not, please don't shoot the messenger. Unless you have to. We're in Arizona. I guess that's a possibility. But don't. <laughs> wow, why'd you cheer? <laughs> <laughs> that was strange. I don't know which part you were cheering, the Arizona part or my death. Okay. Uh, <clears throat> Whether you like it or not, by nature of your baptism, if you have been baptized, you have been baptized into two fundamental calls the church teaches us. The first is the universal call to holiness. The great commandment, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength, and... Thanks, Father. The expert is the only one who made any noise. Okay, come on, let's try this again. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength, and love your neighbor as yourself. We are fundamentally called to grow in love. We are holy because he is holy. We're able to love because he first loved us. We're called to grow. But the second universal call is the universal call to mission. The Great Commission. Go therefore and make disciples of all nations. Friends, you're called to grow, but you're also called to go. And I can't put it any simpler than that. Because it's two very short words that start with G. <laughs> growing and going. The way I like to think about it is we have our grow leg and our go leg as we run the race to heaven. If you're only growing, if you're only feeding, if you're only going to places that help you grow in holiness, you're limping. Similarly, if you're only going, you're limping. Both have to be in tandem. The more we grow, the more we need to give it away. And the more we give it away, the more we need to grow. 
So what I want to focus on tonight is how does the Holy Spirit help us grow and how does the Holy Spirit help us go? You with me? Three of you. Great. All right, everybody stand up. Come on, stand up. Come on. I'm not going to let your energy dip. You've had a good full meal. Uh, I'm a former gym teacher. We got some dodgeballs coming out. No, I'm kidding. But just <laughs> let's do one of these, you know, just make a little movement so that the blood is flowing. Yeah, it feels a little strange. I know. Yeah, okay, that's enough. Sit down. All right, good enough. All right. So let's talk about how the Holy Spirit helps us grow. And in order to illustrate that, I want to point out two images of Scripture that describes the Holy Spirit, two words uh, that helps us understand how the Holy Spirit helps us grow. The first is the Holy Spirit is described as breath. Breath. The breath of God. Or just to impress you, the Hebrew word would be ruah, which is fun to say. Ruah. Look, listen to this from Romans 8. If the spirit of him who raised Jesus from the dead dwells in you, he who raised Christ Jesus from the dead will give life to your mortal bodies also through his spirit who dwells in you. The startling claim of the gospel is that God created us. And he looked at his creation and he says, oh, this is very good. Right? He calls the animals good. He's like, hippos, good. Giraffes, good. Humanity, very good. But then something goes wrong, doesn't it? And sin enters into the equation. And the intimacy with him and the life that he has for us, instead of receiving it, we reach out and we grasp it and we take it out of pride. And we say, okay, yes, you're, you are God, but I want to be like God. And scripture tells us that all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God, and the wages of sin is death. Paul actually talks about we are sons and daughters of wrath now because of sin. So we enter into this world, this is getting a little intense, I, I understand, but we enter into this world under a curse. Our identity as sons and daughters of wrath actually leads to a destiny of condemnation, of damnation, of separation. That's the condition of the human heart, which was once very good, has now become very bad. But then we know the good news of the gospel, and the good news of the gospel is only good news if you believe the bad news. It's like, why do we need a savior unless we need to be saved? <laughs> and the good news of the gospel is that Jesus comes and he takes on human flesh. He takes on the curse, right? And what did we just celebrate last week? That journey of going to war with sin and death. Going into the grave, rising from the grave, and breaking now the power of sin and death. And now, all of a sudden, humanity has the hope and the opportunity for a new life. And not just any life, not just more of our life, but God's life. His life is now accessible to us. And through our baptism and through our faith, and through saying yes to this, Jesus pours out his spirit on all those who believe. And now all of a sudden, when the spirit of God dwells in you through your baptism and confirmation, and when you cooperate with that spirit, and you live in that spirit, all of a sudden your identity, which was, now, which was once sons and daughters of wrath, becomes what? You are sons and daughters of God. And the destiny of a son and daughter of wrath is damnation, condemnation. The destiny of a son or daughter of God is salvation. Separation becomes intimacy. And I already said it, but what Scripture shows us is we are holy because He is holy. And the Holy One, through His Spirit, comes and makes a home in me. Think about, have, have you, I mean, think about that for a second. That God comes and lives in you. You become the Holy of Holies. God! Like, what if we actually walked around with that as our belief? That, like, I am a temple of the Holy Spirit. What would life look like if we actually believed that? I actually don't know fully because I don't do it enough. But Scripture gives us some hints. Where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is freedom. The fruits of the Spirit in Galatians. Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. That sounds pretty great. Could use a little bit more of that. The holiness you seek, the desire to live in union with God, is a work of God. It's a surrendering to what He wants to do in you. 
So ruah, breath. And if you want a little deeper study on this, look up Ezekiel 37, where Ezekiel talks about the breath of God coming into dry bones. And it's a beautiful thing. And it's a profound thing. And that's what the Holy Spirit does to us. He breathes life into us. What was once dead becomes alive. Okay? So breath. Second image is fire. Fire. What does fire do? Fire does lots of things. One of the things fire does is it converts things. It changes things. If you pl apply fire to water, it turns into gas. Right? So it transforms something. It propels something. So if you big a, build a big enough fire and you channel it, you can go to the moon. Like big explosion from fire, channeled, boo, blast off. Movement comes from fire, channeled fire. Uh, fire illuminates. It provides light. One of my favorite definitions of conversion is from Pope Benedict where he talks about conversion is receiving new sight. He says conversion is things going from black and white to technicolor, from blurry to clear. The scales fall and we see the world as it actually is. One of the reasons why this is such an important one for me is because if you walk out on that campus or you walk across anywhere in our culture, one of the things that becomes abundantly clear is that people have rejected the light that comes from God. We have pushed God out of our minds and out of our universities and out of our Everywhere, we just kind of push, no, the light that comes from God, we've been pushing him out, and we're living in a darkness. Now, all of a sudden, we don't know how to define things anymore. We don't know which way is up. We're stumbling around, bumping into things, because the light of truth that is the Holy Spirit has been rejected. And again, if you want deeper study on that, look up Romans 1. Romans 1 is all about what happens when people reject God. He said, Just a little preview, he says, St. Paul says, our senseless minds are darkened because we've exchanged the truth about God for a lie. And finally, one of the things fire does is it purifies. I'm going to read from a, a section of scripture that I'm sure you've read many times, but bear with me. This is from Sirach chapter 2. One time I gave this, this talk and the person in like the third row was like, is that in the Bible? <laughs> And I was like, yes, it is. It's right here. You want to see it? And he was like, no way. And I was like, I know. You need to read your Bible more, man. All right. <laughs> Listen to this. My son or daughter, if you come forward to serve the Lord, prepare yourself for, for a trial. Set your heart right and be steadfast and do not be hasty in time of calamity. Cleave to him and do not depart that you may be honored at the end of your life. Here's the key part. Accept whatever is brought upon you and in changes that humble you, be patient. Is that... Is that not the best definition of freshman year of college? <laughs> Changes that humble you? Yeah. I was about to be like, who are the freshmen in here? But you're already suffering enough. I'm not going to have it. <laughs> Here's, here it is. For gold is tested in the fire and acceptable men in the furnace of humiliation. Furnace of humiliation. Sign me up. Doesn't that sound great? <laughs> yeah. Woo. No, man, nobody's, like, nobody's getting excited about a furnace of humiliation. But here's one of the things I've learned about life. Uh, you don't have to go looking for furnaces of humiliation. You don't have to go looking for suffering. It's going to happen. You are going to do things that cause suffering, and things are going to be done to you that cause suffering. It's just part of the human condition. The question is, what do you do when you find yourself in a furnace of humiliation? Do you fight it? Do you run from it? Do you rage against it? Or do you offer it to the Lord? And do you wait on him? And do you allow him to do something through it? A few years ago, I got a phone call from my dad, which was not unusual. We talked every day. He was my best friend, uh, my hero. And I got a call from him. He said, Pete, I'm very sorry to tell you this, but I just got diagnosed with uh, stage four cancer. Only 50 people in the country get it every year. Very, very rare form of cancer. They don't even know what it is, so they just kept adding adjectives to it. So they had eight words in the description of this cancer. So in our family, we started calling it uh, WAC, W-A-C. It stood for weird-ass cancer. Pardon me, Father. <laughs> but that's what we call it. Dad's got WAC. 
man, if they think you do weird things with the TikTok videos in here, what I just said, if that goes viral, man, I'm, I'm going to shut down right there with you, Father. That's going to be great. <clears throat> Bring it on. So dad's got whack. And I watched this man who I loved more than any other guy over the course of a year go through a furnace of humiliation. If you've ever had the privilege of walking with somebody when they die, there are many, 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 many moments that are very hard and very uncomfortable. And finally it culminated where um, I was right by his bedside, my brother was there, our wives were there, my mom was there, and we were like cheering him into heaven. You know, he had lost all his weight, he was covered in these grotesque purple sores because that's how the cancer manifested itself. And I have to tell you friends, like, this is true. Um, the moment he died, I was holding his hand and um, I was obviously heartbroken. He was my best, my best friend, you know? So I was, I was crying and I was so, so sad. But with the moment he died, what rose up within me was uh, joy. This experience of joy. Because I was so happy for him. Because he was home. He had fought the good fight. He'd finished the race. Prize of everlasting glory was his. And what I had experienced was exactly what Sirach 2 talks about. He had become gold. The outer man had wasted away, but the inner man oh, was alive. And he had cleaved to the Lord and did not depart. And I tell you what, he was honored at the end of his life. I wish you could have seen his funeral. There were about 650 people in the church worshiping God, thanking God for the gift of this man. And this is not a joke, but multiple people have come back to faith because of what they saw at the funeral. And what did they see? They saw gold. You put garbage in a fire to destroy it. You put gold in a fire to make it more uh, goldy, right? To make it more pure. And so when you find yourself in those moments of humiliation, in that times of suffering, in those times of suffering, the response of a disciple is say, Holy Spirit, purify me. Burn out the things that need to be burned out so that I might shine. Okay? Okay, so breath and fire to help us grow. Now let's focus on how the Holy Spirit helps us go. And I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to illustrate this with uh, three words that start with C. Okay? First one. The Holy Spirit helps us go on mission by giving us, providing us courage. There's this great section of, of Acts, and we're going to get to it in the readings coming up, but Stephen is brought before the Sanhedrin. So Stephen uh, is brought before the very men that put Jesus to death. And they're mad at him, but they say, all right, defend yourself, Stephen. And biblically speaking, he talks for a very long time. Okay? And at the end of it, listen to what he says. I love this. He says, you stiff-necked people, uncircumcised in heart and ears, you always resist the Holy Spirit. Honestly, I have no idea what he means by uncircumcised in heart and ears. But I do know that if you say that to, like, a group of Jewish men, that's like, that's, that's yeah, that's, that's like a mic drop. That's fighting words right there. <laughs> and we know that's true because listen to their response. Now, when they heard these things, they were enraged and they ground their teeth against him. My wife and I, we have uh, one of our sons, his name is Zeke, he's great, he's five, he leads with his head at all times, he's just, if he's not running into something with his head, he is unhappy. Um, but when he was three, he discovered that anger was an emotion he could express. He, he realized, I can express what's going on inside me, and this is pretty great. And so he would do things like, I'm mad at you, Dad, or, like, or one time, one of the worst moments of my parenting, it was, uh, we were at Sunday Mass, and... Uh, He's starting to get fidgety, and he punches his brother, and so I'm like, okay, now I've got to be a dad. And so I, like, pick him up, and I realize it's, right to be the, it's about to be the consecration, but I'm like, maybe I can sneak out just in time. So the whole church is quiet. Father's going like, mm -hmm. and, uh, <laughs> and I pick up Zeke, and I try to, like, escape as fast as I can, and Zeke, who's got, like, seven words in his vocabulary at this point, announces to the church, he goes, you're mean, dad. <laughs> it's just like, ugh. And our priest, who I love him to death, he was literally, like, here, and he, and he snorted. <laughs> yep. So anyway, when a three-year-old grinds their teeth at you in anger, it's cute. Yeah? When grown men grind their teeth at another grown man, that's not cute. That's, that means they have lost control. Because only crazy people grind their teeth at other people. That's what Stephen is looking at. 
That's the threat. That's what's right in front of him. Listen to Stephen's response. But Stephen, full of the Holy Spirit, gazed into heaven and saw the glory of God and Jesus standing at the right hand of God. And he said, Behold, I see the heavens open and the Son of Man standing at the right hand of God. What does the Holy Spirit give us in those moments when it's time to bear witness, but there's a threat, when it's scary, when it's dangerous? What does the Holy Spirit do? He elevates our gaze so that we see why it's worth it. So now we're not focused on the threat, we're focused on what it leads to. Stephen sees Jesus and he's like, oh man, do whatever you want to me, because that's where I'm going. And over and over again, we see these in the martyrs. St. Lawrence is like, I'm done on this side, flip me over. Where's that coming from? It's coming from a place, St. Lawrence didn't like, you know, get in a circle with other disciples and get himself all revved up before that moment. It wasn't like a, you know, before a basketball game where you see these, uh, uh, uh. no, it wasn't something he generated for himself. No, it was a gift of the Spirit. The Spirit giving him something to persevere and do the thing that was necessary, even if there's a threat. To have courage. One of my favorite definitions of courage is from a guy named Joseph Pieper. He says, courage is the willingness to be wounded for a noble cause. Willingness to suffer a wound for a noble cause. What the Holy Spirit does in times when courage is necessary is he reminds us and convicts us and convinces us of the noble cause. So if you're feeling like, I don't have the courage to do anything out there in the public world about Jesus, you're like, yeah, I know. So give yourself more to the power of the Holy Spirit. So courage. Second thing, second word that starts with C to help us understand how the Holy Spirit helps us go is charisms. Charisms. What are charisms? Charisms are supernatural gifts of God designed for the building up of the kingdom. They're a big fancy word for God's power in us expressed in particular ways to help people come to faith. Charisms are not so much about helping me grow in holiness, though that's always part of the equation. It's really more about how do I help extend the kingdom? And I don't have time tonight to do like a full theological discourse on charisms, but talk to the focused missionaries because they're ready to go. They're doing prayer groups and prayer teams and stuff. But the point is, what I, what the main point I want to make about charisms is that they're gifts. They're freely offered. And um, you realize it's the, it's the epitome of pride to look at God and say, Lord, I, I want your help, but I don't want that gift because I'm an introvert or it makes me uncomfortable or I, I just don't, I just don't, like, I want everything you have, but not that. No, the posture, friends, needs to be, Lord, I want everything you have for me and I want a double portion. I had an old teacher used to say, if God's given out gifts, I'm getting in line twice. The humility to be able to receive from the Lord, to be docile to what the Spirit's doing in us, and then to cooperate with Him. I believe Jesus when He says we should pray for people to be physically healed. So I do. All the time. And I can stand before you today having prayed for probably hundreds of people to be physically healed. And I think, I was telling the missionaries, I think I've got one not I, but like there's only been one person that I've directly prayed over that I've seen any sort of physical healing from. But I'm not going to stop because it's not my job. I can't heal anybody. That's the Holy Spirit's job. It's my job not to wonder if I can do it. My job is to do what I'm told to do and trust him with the results. And that's where charisms come in, to empower us to, do, to be faithful and to be fruitful. Okay? So, and the final uh, word that starts with C is conviction. The Holy Spirit gives us conviction. I've noticed something, that without the Holy Spirit active in our life, one of the things that we will almost always do is we will shave off the, the hard edges of the gospel. We won't give the full story. We'll give the story that we think is palatable, that, that people want to hear. I'll just speak for myself. Whenever I'm not walking fully in the power of the Holy Spirit, whenever I'm not kind of relying on Him completely, and, and I'm, I'm trying to go and help somebody meet, meet Jesus and, you know, fall in love with Him, I'll, I'll always kind of diminish sin. I'll diminish judgment. I'll diminish heaven and hell and the, the eternal consequences. I, I'll always kind of shave those down a little bit. 
Because that's the hard stuff. It's the stuff that we think is going to be most difficult for the world to receive, right? That there really is a heaven and there really is a hell. And both are possibilities. And that sin exists. And it's okay to call sin, sin. In fact, it's necessary for us to call sin, sin. To help people. It's not loving to ignore sin. It's not loving to pretend it's not sin. It's not loving to say something like, broad and wide is the way that leads to life, and everybody finds it, and narrow is the way that leads to death, and few there are that find it. That's not loving, because that's the exact opposite of what Jesus said. Jesus said, broad and wide is the way that leads to destruction, and many there are that are finding it. And he said, narrow is the way that leads to life, and few are finding it. Jesus said this not because that's what he wants. He says this so that we will do something about it. He's revealing the truth of our condition so that believers will actually have it deep in our hearts enough to be able to risk and say, it's worth it to me to put myself out there for you because I know it matters. I know, I believe it actually matters whether or not you know Jesus. Friends, it really matters whether or not you say yes to him. It really matters. Not just your life here on earth, but for all eternity. I mean, listen to this. This is from 1 John. This is John, the beloved apostle. John, who uses the word love like 15,000 times in everything he writes. Love is love. That love is love. Is love that loves, you know? And I'm like, John, I don't get it. This, that guy. Listen to this. And this is the testimony that God gave us eternal life, and this life is in his Son. He who has the Son has life. And he who has not the Son does not have life. Judgment, who goes where, all of that is way above my pay grade. And yours too. We're not deciding anything. But we are responsible to believe what Jesus teaches about these things. And Jesus is preoccupied with helping us know what's really going on. Helping us understand what's really going on in our heart, what's really going on in the world, and what's really going on after we die. Because, not to be a downer, but uh, you're all going to die. I know, hot take. Yeah. <laughs> and actually, Scripture talks about how life is short. It's a passing shadow. Here today, gone tomorrow. So you could say you're all going to die soon. And the fact of the matter is, yeah, wow, really fun. And so it really matters where you are with the Lord. And I promise the conviction to believe what I just said, to live in what I just said, is not something that just comes naturally to humans. It's not something that we just kind of naturally go, yeah, you're right, I like that. You know what, I want to talk to people about that. Now, that is not something generally, there's always a few contrarians. I have a buddy, Joey, who's just like, I want to talk about sin all the time. And I'm like, dude, chill out, you know? But that's a different problem. But the, the point is, the conviction to believe the truth of who we are, what we're made for, where we're going, and the battle we're in comes from the Holy Spirit. Okay, so courage, charisms, and conviction. I'm running out of time, but I want to just give you a couple practical things to do because I know there's some type A personalities. There's probably an engineer in the room who's like, what do I do about it? You know. So here is the step-by-step uh, -step thing. I, uh, there's, just, there's a few really quick things you can do. Okay? First practical tip for living more in the power of the Holy Spirit, ask for more. Ask for more. Jesus is never going to run out of his spirit. He's never going to be like, well, you got it all. I mean, in many ways, he's, he has actually given us all. It's more of a case of being uh, open to the all that he has for us. It's less about so much of something out there that needs to like, land on me and more about a releasing, a surrendering of what's already within me. Pope Francis talked about not caging the Holy Spirit, which is a radical thing to think about that. We have the, we have the power to cage the Holy Spirit in our hearts. So if you're feeling like, I'm not sure I'm flowing in the power of the Holy Spirit, Start asking the Holy Spirit to be more alive in you. To give him more permission. Just, I mean, it's a simple prayer. Come Holy Spirit. I want more. It's like a text message to Jesus. <laughs> Come Holy Spirit. That's tip number one. Oh, and um, if you want more, another way to kind of get more is to ask Mary's help. Because she's the spouse of the Spirit. And she, I mean, what spouse doesn't love introducing their spouse to others? <laughs> in, at least in a healthy way relationship, you know? 
I mean, I, I, my wife is amazing. I wish I, could, I wish I could introduce her to you. So Mary just absolutely loves helping her children be filled more with the power of the Holy Spirit. Tip number two. If you want more fire, find people who are on fire and spend time with them. Because fire tends to beget more fire. When somebody who's on fire spends time around other people who are on fire, it just kind of expands that way. And so something like this is a great example. But one of the things that helps fire spread is to talk about it. To not just kind of hope like, oh, I'm next, you know, I'm next to Abel, so maybe there'll be like fire by osmosis, you know? Um, <laughs> but no, to be like, hey man, you've got something that I want. Can we talk about that? Can we pray about that? And one of the things, the ways the, the disciples in Acts of the Apostles spread the fire is they actually asked for it to come everywhere they went. There's this really dramatic moment where Peter, I think it's Peter, encounters, it might have been Paul, I should know this, but they, they come up to a group, no, it is Paul, and he's like, hey, have you received the Holy Spirit? And they're like, we didn't even know there was a Holy Spirit. And he's like, that's kind of bad catechesis, but we're going to go with it. And so they pray, they're like, well, you need him. And they pray, and the scripture says, like, Pentecost happened again. And so everywhere you go, if you've got the fire, share it. And if you want more, find the people who have it and ask for it. Okay? So that's tip number two. Tip number three is to be bold. To be bold. One of the ways charisms are discerned is in action. One of the ways kind of knowing whether or not the Lord wants you to do something is to actually take the step. It's very hard to have a prophetic word for somebody if you never open your mouth. It's very hard to see somebody physically healed unless we pray that they are. And again, he's the protagonist. He's in charge. We're just obedient and faithful. But it takes a level of boldness to go from, okay, 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 okay. My, the image of this that I love is Peter getting out of the boat. Jesus says, come on out, walk towards me. Peter had to decide whether or not he was going to. Walked to the edge of the boat, you know, climbed on the side, maybe did one of these actions, right? Ooh. And at some point, he had to go. So you got to get out of the boat. You got to, it's not testing God, it's trusting God to follow what he's leading you to do. And we're going to stop there because I want to make sure we have some time for discussion. Uh, one last thing I'll say. You want more of the Spirit? You got to read the book that he inspired. You want to hear God's voice? Read his voice. <laughs> All right? I can't tell you how many people are like, I never hear God talk to me. I'm like, well, do you ever open your Bible? And they're like, well, you know, it's at my bedside. I'm like, great. You know, that's, that's a good start. Again, it's almost like scripture by osmosis. If, if I just sit next to it, it's like, and a lot of times, you know, you want to know the, the, the scripture test? This is the Bible test. You know you've been reading enough or better way to put it, you know you haven't been reading enough if you open your Bible and it closes automatically, you're not reading your scriptures enough. Some of you didn't get that, which is clear evidence that you're not reading your scriptures enough. You should be able to open any page in your Bible and have it stay open. Okay? So read the book. Read the scriptures and let the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God, Scripture says, pierce your heart and live in you and speak to you. So we're going to break for a second and let you discuss for a second, but we can't talk about the Holy Spirit without uh, inviting Him to do something, to move. So whatever posture you want to get in to, to demonstrate receptivity to the Lord, whether you want to stand, kneel, sit, hands open, hands closed, close your eyes, open your eyes, I don't care. Hold your girlfriend's hand if that makes you feel more comfortable, that's fine. <laughs> Not you first year focus missionaries though, that is... <laughs> and let's just pray. One of the best ways to just let the Holy Spirit move is to not try to force it. To not try to generate an emotional moment. Because we're not seeking emotion, we're seeking Him. So let's just sit in the Spirit for a minute. Come Holy Spirit. Come Holy Spirit. Holy Spirit, we give you permission to move in our hearts, to purify us, to transform us, to propel us, to equip us. 
Holy Spirit, we want more. You are a God of abundance. You are never outdone in generosity, so we boldly come into the throne room right now, Lord, and ask for more. New gifts, new insights, new freedom. getting a sense from the Lord right now that there's somebody or maybe multiple people in here who feel like they are walking with a weight attached to their leg. That they are dragging a weight. They're shackled to this. And what it is, I think, is a, is a past sin. And I just feel like right now, in the name of Jesus, we, Lord, we just ask that you would break that chain and set them free from that shackle that they could walk with freedom and confidence and joy, that they are forgiven. Yeah, I feel like the Lord's saying there's some people in here who don't believe they're forgiven. And the Lord wants to say to you right now, you are forgiven, you are loved, and I'm setting you free. Come, Holy Spirit. And Lord, we ask that the, the work that you are doing tonight would continue to grow, that you would inspire each person in here to continue to respond to whatever it is that's going in your heart. I just invite your friends to just be very aware for the next couple minutes, that's actually the next 15 seconds, just be very aware of what you're thinking, what you're feeling, and kind of just aware of God's presence. And don't doubt if you feel happy don't say no to it. If God wants you to feel good, say yes. If you don't feel anything, that's fine too. But just, just be very conscious of what is happening in your mind and in your heart and your body right now. And just thank the Lord for whatever he's doing and just be aware of it. also getting a sense that there are several people in here who have someone on their heart that they know they need to go talk to about the Lord. That they know the Lord is creating an, uh, an opportunity to share him with that person. And they're scared. You're scared. You're nervous. You feel ill-equipped. And Jesus is saying, go. Trust me. Listen to me. Amen. Amen. All right, why don't we uh, turn to the person or persons next to you and just kind of say whatever's on your heart. Maybe it's something from the talk that inspired you. Maybe it was just in this prayer time you felt like the Lord spoke to you. Maybe you got a prophetic word for the guy across the room and go talk to him about it. But speak to somebody about what the Lord has been doing tonight and then we'll bring it back in and we'll have a little question and answer time. Okay? All right. <clears throat> I'm not even sure this is doing anything. Is this microphone even doing anything? It's not on? Did I speak the entire night into a dead mic? Okay. Because that would have been like, that's pretty awesome. All right, let's bring it back in. If you've got any questions or comments, comments are more dangerous. I might cut you off if it's not a helpful comment, but. Questions? Yes, ma'am. Is it possible to like, like the spark of the Holy Spirit in someone who does not want to receive it, or is that futile? Uh, interesting question. Um, well, the Holy, the, I mean, God can do whatever He wants, right? Generally, uh, He very much respects 
kind of what we will give him permission to do. There are certainly instances of very intense divine intervention. I'm thinking of like, uh, is it one of the Persian kings with the, the handwriting on the wall? It's kind of like, whoa, that's, but even that was external, you know? There's, it's, um, no, I, I, I don't think, I mean, there's not something, the person has to say yes, even in some small way, even some mysterious way. The danger I think we get into sometimes is anticipating whether or not we think they've said yes, or we think they want to say yes, or uh, whether or not they've said yes enough by our standards. And God just plays by his own rules when it comes to the open, you open the door a little bit, he, he can move in that. So I don't think it's so much a, a thought of, I have to light the spark, because you don't have to convince God to go on mission. Jesus is constantly seeking every single person you meet for the rest of your life and the rest of their life. There is no one on the face of the earth that Jesus doesn't want to have a relationship with. So you don't have to convince him to like be a savior. You, know, you don't have to like come into your classroom and like, okay, I got to drum up some mission so that God will show up and he'll bless it. No, it's the exact opposite. I come into the classroom and I say, Lord, what are you already doing here? And do you want me to do it with you? Because you know he's already working. You can take that to the bank. It's a question of whether or not he wants your participation or not. And that's his call. So I, the, the thought of whether or not I can like, light a spark in somebody else, no, I mean, that's, that's all between them and the Lord. But I certainly can be a, a channel of grace for that. I can be a, a participant in that reality. But, um, yeah, I don't know if that's helpful. Interesting question. Good, interesting, or bad, interesting? Uh, good, interesting, yeah. I, 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 like, I really like most questions. The first question they asked me at Arizona State last night was definitely not interesting compared to that. The guy, the guy like, walked up and he was like, um, this is on camera, but he was like, <laughs> he was like, Michael Jordan or LeBron James? Goat. And I was like, Michael Jordan, obviously. But, um, <clears throat> So that was much deeper. It must be something of the elevation or something. You got. <laughs> we call it the father mad influence. <laughs> yeah, the father mad influence. Yeah. Yes, sir. Well, I got two questions. Is it philosophical? Uh, not really. Okay. <laughs> so, um, like a lot of these gifts that you talk about, like courage, like they require a lot of obedience to be able to accept that. Like, how do you? Ex how do you? I know you didn't talk about this. How do you? Is there like any tips or how do you think we should? asked to grow in that obedience. And then the second question was more towards Shannon. And you said that we're not like invited to like, oh, we have to tell God to light a spirit and he's already working. So how do we discern whether we're, we're supposed to be participating in that or not? Because yeah. that's where a lot of us struggle. Like, sure. should we help them or should we let God or someone else is able to do that? You know? mm -hmm. Well, the number one roadblock to obedience is pride. Right? So pride says, my way, not your way. Humility says, your will be done, right? So if you want to grow in obedience is to first grow in humility to say, and how do you grow in humility then is the next obvious question, which is A, to ask the Lord to purify you of your own desires, to make my heart like yours, to break my heart for what breaks yours, to make me desire the things that you have for me. And if you don't even, ha if you don't even desire what God wants for you, ask for the desire to desire the things that God wants for you, to really just... Uh, and very practically, there's this thing called the litany of humility, which is the most dangerous, painful prayer out there. But man, does it work. It's this litany of where you just are praying out, you're verbalizing the posture that you want before God. So there's no substitute for humility in, in tying to obedience. But the other thing that obedience requires in the kingdom is love, intimacy. Jesus says, I, I do what the Father commands me. Why? So that the world might know that I love the Father. Our obedience is not just out of servile fear. Actually, what does Jesus say? I, I no longer call you slaves, but friends. But he says, you are my friends if you do what I command you. <laughs> so there's this beautiful reality of intimacy with God creates this love to want to do what he wants me to do. And the more I do what he wants me to do, the deeper the friendship develops and the more the love comes out. So in the kingdom of God, we don't separate humility, intimacy, and obedience. They're all woven together. 
So you want to obey God more? Spend more time with him and be, fall more in love with him. You want to fall more in love with him? Obey him. The, they go hand in hand. And then the second question of like, how do you know whether or not God wants, Jesus wants you to participate in the mission? I don't know, man. You just got to gotta learn the voice of the Lord and you got to start to, there's going to be some times where you're like, man, I really tried that, that didn't work. And other times you're like, okay, uh, clearly the Lord wanted me to do this. But there's no, I, I've not found a manual. There's not like a, do you ever have those choose your own adventure books? It's like, Billy said, you know, this, turn to page seven. It's like, there's nothing quite like that. It's, it's, it's a relationship. It's a life that you have to, and you just kind of, you got to smile a lot. You got to laugh a lot. You got to be in a community that's willing to kind of be like, man, I totally messed up. It didn't work at all. And everybody's like, that's okay. Keep going. And sometimes it's, it's great. And sometimes you're going to put your foot in your mouth. And then sometimes the Lord's going to say something through and you're going to be like, this is amazing. You know, I'll give you a little story. We, um, we, did, we do work on campuses from time to time and just kind of like street evangelization type stuff. We walk around, ask people if they want to take a survey and college students love to take surveys. And so they'll start talking to us and we'll be like, you know, you know, what is your source of truth and who is, what do you think of Pope Francis? And then my favorite question we, is, we ask is, who is Jesus to you? Because as soon as you ask Jesus, the Jesus question, uh, everything changes. Because you can't introduce the name of Jesus into a conversation without some response. I've never said the name of Jesus to somebody without seeing something in their eyes. Sometimes it's love, sometimes it's fear, sometimes it's confusion, sometimes it's hate. So one time we were walking, and again, this is kind of the fire, but gets fire. I invited a guy named Carl to do it with me. I was like, hey, Carl, you want to come on campus with me? And he was like, okay. And, we, we, and I said, Carl, one of the things we're going to do, we're going to ask the Holy Spirit to tell us who we should go talk to. And he said, all right. And so we prayed, and I said, all right, did you hear anything, Carl? And he said, uh, he said yeah, I think, I think we're supposed to um, talk to somebody under a tree. And I was like, Carl, look around you. <laughs> the University of Michigan campus is literally under trees. I mean, like the entire campus is, I was like, dude, that's like impossible for us not to talk. But do you think you heard the learning? He's like, no, man, I'm feeling it. It's under a tree. And I was like, okay, let's go. So we started walking around. We're talking to a bunch of people. And all of a sudden we get into this conversation with this guy and we, we ask him these questions and we end up praying with him. We end up sharing the gospel with him. He ends up saying that he's going to start to check out church again. He's, he's like, I'm not converted, but I'm interested. I'm like, that's a great start. And so he walks away. I give Carl a high five and I glance down and I look for the first time I notice we are literally standing in roots. Like we weren't under a tree. I was like standing on a root. You know, like one that comes out of the ground. And I was like, Carl, we're under a tree. <laughs> and he was like, ah! you know. <laughs> and so that was one of those times where we just, we felt like the Lord said something and we, we moved in it. But there have been plenty of other times where I'm like, okay, Lord, I, I think you want me to do this and, and I'm just going gonna, gonna to trust you with it. So I know that's a, probably a pretty unsatisfying answer, but there's no substitute for just being, having, again, the humility and the trust to say, Lord, I want to know your will. Another way to put it is every disciple asks two questions constantly. If you want to be with Jesus, if you want to follow Jesus, you need to ask yourself two questions. What's God saying to me and what am I doing about it? Now, you were asking, how do I know what God's saying to me? But a lot of times we know what God is saying to me in the doing about it as we start to act on it as well. Okay? Wait, is that the, that's the sign? All right, cool. <laughs> Father, you who are goodness, you are generous, you have given us life, and you have given us life in you through the sacraments. Lord, we ask you to call, we invite you to call down your Holy Spirit upon us, stir up the spirit that you've given us, that we might be people free, truly free, with peace, joy, life, where your perfect love casts out all fear. And so, Father, help us to walk in that freedom and peace this day and every day. And, Father, I ask your blessing upon these, your beloved sons and daughters, in whom you are well pleased, in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Make a couple announcements about what's coming up. Uh, next week is our last speaker of the year, and then we have a few socials. And so, we're going to finish the year with some fun. Uh, but next week, it's a woman. She's coming out as part of the Spitzer Institute. They, and he has a theme called Healing the Culture. 
culture is important, that's what we're in, and so how do we help culture be healthy? Um, and so, anyways, this woman's gonna come and talk to us about that, and in conjunction with that, on Friday afternoon from 12.30 to 5.30, she's going to be doing a workshop on using reason, logic, compassion, truth to talk about pro-life issues. So I know that's on a lot of people's hearts and we're like, I don't even know how to bring that up or how do I engage with some of those topics. And so she's going to walk you through that in just a very humble way where you can walk out with a lot of tools. And so I'd love to see, she's it's kind of a special opportunity that's happening for us. Uh, so I invite you to sign up. There's a, a flyer on the bulletin board. You can scan the QR code um, and you can sign up. Come be a part of that uh, next Friday. Uh, let's see. We, uh, we still are accepting Newman Center scholarships. There's three folders. People want to give money to you. Um, you didn't even know that. They want to give you money uh, to help you get to school. And so you can apply for those scholarships. Two more things. Uh, we are, we just finished a pot, our applications for Newman Leads for next year. And a part of the leads is they're gonna have team members who help make things happen. So if we wanna help foster community life, there's people that are like, I don't wanna be in charge, but I'll help. I'll give you an hour a week or a couple hours a month. And so it'd be, in my mind, it'd be great for every person to think about look at the topics and say, what would I like to be involved in? And it's a great way to get involved, to volunteer, and to help build this culture, this community, so that more students can feel welcome, come to know the Lord's love. So I invite you to pray about that. At the very least, grab one of those papers on your way out and, uh, and ask, ask the Holy Spirit. Uh, and, and that's how it works. It's on your heart, if I can offer my own two cents. I, mean, I remember one day, my first year here, I saw this dude, and, uh, and I was like, who's that dude? And after Mass, I was like, hey man, do you want to have lunch this week? And he said, I've been wanting to talk to you, Father. I was like, that's the Holy Spirit. And that's, that's like confirmation. Um, yeah, that's time I, I walked into a, a store to buy shoes, and I said, where's your shoe department? And I was wearing my clerks. And they said, are you here to see Tim? I said, is Tim in the shoe department? <laughs> Yes, I am. <laughs> so I got the shoe department and I was like, Tim, I'm Father Man. God sent me to see you. <laughs> anyway, so you just, you, just you start to recognize the Lord's movements and the Holy Spirit is very playful. Um, anyway, so yeah, ask the Holy Spirit to guide you in that and I think you will be blessed more than you realize. Last little thing, if you're graduating and uh, you're an education major, there's a job fair tomorrow at the High Country conference center from 10 a.m. to 2 p.m. and the Catholic Diocese of Phoenix has a table so if you want a job go over there say Father Matt sent me I want to be a teacher and they will hook you up. Sound good? We have some apple crisp and ice cream and uh, let's thank Pete for making the trip out here and being